Hello, my name is Katie Sando and welcome to the Marketing Forum podcast where I catch up with lots of different people on all things life, work, leadership, careers and of course marketing, comms and creative. In this episode I had the absolute pleasure of being joined by Jason Clark. Jason is one of the directors of DCA PR and he is one of those crazy people that knew since a very young age that he wanted to be in journalism and it wasn't until later that he transferred into PR. We had such a great conversation chatting about uh, some of his funny early journalism stories and less amusing but still very interesting uh, crisis crisis comms situations. So loads to learn from Jason. I have been very lucky over the last couple of years to be able to work quite a lot with Jason. He's absolutely one of my favourite people to work with and I really think you will enjoy this conversation. I don't think many people know that you were at university with Mr. Rees Mogg. <laughs> I feel like that's a claim to fame that you should be using more, more often. Yes, well, you know, I, um, yes, I was at Oxford. I won't say that I used to hang around with Jacob Rees-Mogg, but <laughs> we were there at the same time. That's correct. And, then that, and that's as far as I'm going. <laughs> that's probably about as far as I'll go. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm really interested in is uh, before you even got to Oxford, you, you were born in the States? Yeah, so I was born in Massachusetts, and my folks were living out there at the time. Um, they went out for what's meant to be a year and ended up staying for eight, I think, in the end. So, yeah, I, I was born in Massachusetts and we lived in Canada and then moved back to the UK when I was six years old. Um, but then I went back out when I was 16 to an international school. So, I mean, I can tell you that story if you want to hear it. I think it's really interesting because, uh, you know, with you know, knowing where you went after that, I think it's interesting that you started out there. So yes, I would love to hear that story. Well, I suppose, so, I mean, in terms of my background is, um, my career was started as a, as a journalist. And what got me interested in journalism was when I was a teenager. So from the age of about 14, I think I always knew that I wanted to do journalism. And I, I can't, point to any single thing that sort of inspired that but so when I was in school I used to sort of work on the school magazine and things like that and you know write little bits for it and um and then helped edit the school mag um so that was all great stuff and then I won a scholarship to go to an international school in New Mexico which is part of North America not Mexico um so it's one of the states in America um, and that was an amazing experience. I was 16, so got on a plane, uh, flew out to Albuquerque um, and spent the next two years um, in the foothills of the, I think, the Sangro, Sangro de Cristo Mountains. I can't even say that. Um, anyway, so it's quite a high altitude place and uh, up in the mountains with about 220 other students from 70 different nationalities. Oh, my God, is that uh, all? Yeah, so it's quite a small college and you studied the international baccalaureate um, rather than A-levels. So if I'd been at home, I would have been doing A-levels. And part of the curriculum, they're called United World Colleges and there's a a growing network of them around the world. Um, And as part of the curriculum, we had to do what's called a community service. And that could be various things. Um, We used to go into like, care homes and play music for people and that kind of stuff um but i managed to get interested in a local newspaper called the las vegas daily optic so this is las vegas new mexico not las <laughs> nevada right so i'm not sort of free, free rolling through casinos or something like that but it meant that one afternoon a week i would go and work on the local paper the optic which was a daily broadsheet um i, I don't, don't know what the circulation was but it was a very local rag. Um, and then, so I did that and loved it, absolutely loved it. And they, they used to, my byline used to say, Jason Clark, UWC intern. And, they, and the lovely thing is, I've still got all the clippings. They kept all my English spellings. So if I was spelling the word colour, you know, it would have a U in it. And Aww. they kept quirk um, because I was a Brit. 
you see. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, I was 17 when I was doing that. And um, one of the first big stories I did, um, it, it stopped me if I'm boring you, but one of the first big stories was uh, I, I came in one day and they said, right, can you do the routine calls, which is basically calling up the emergency services and finding out had anything juicy happened overnight. Oh my God, that's crazy. And uh, I, phoned this, I phoned the state police and they said, oh yeah, we're dealing with a toxic chemical spill. And I said, oh right, where's that then? And they said, well, it's between, kind of between Santa Fe and Raton Pass, which is like, it's about 170 miles distance. And I'm like, my God, what's happened? And basically what someone had done is um, on an Amtrak train, right, passenger train, they'd filled all their luggage with um, a hallucinogenic drug called PCP, which they dissolved in ether. And when the train got to Raton Pass, which is about, I don't know, seven and a half, eight thousand 8,000 feet, all these containers ruptured and of course vaporized and contaminated the entire baggage car. So, and they had to evacuate some parts of the train as well um, because they were worried that people would just start hallucinating. I was gonna say, was, did everyone so, just get high as a kite on that journey? So um, anyway, so, it was a great story and it was the reason I remember it, it was the first one that was picked up by on the wires so basically Associated Press I filed the story to, to my own paper um, typewritten this was with a typewriter and a sort of you know 100 foot roll of paper feeding into it and um, yeah that was fantastic so that really gave me the bug and um, the, the photographer there a guy called Lee he had a radio police radio scanner and we were at his house one night having a beer scanner went off we got to a house fire before the fire brigade because um, he had a Trans Am as well, so it was quite quick. So, you know, I'm a teenager. I'm just, you know, loving this stuff. So that really gave me the, the journalism bug, I guess. Yeah. Do you think there's, um, is there, when you say like the bug, was it like the, the, like the buzz of actually um, getting it in print? Was it the buzz of uh, being able to get the story or was it just kind of like the whole shebang? It's the whole shebang, really. And, and you know, seeing your name in print when you're a teenager um, and, you know, that's something you've written and your editor hasn't hacked it about too much, which means you've actually done quite a good job with a piece of copy. is really quite exciting and really quite satisfying. Um, and at the end of the day, I've just, you know, I'm a storyteller. I still am. And, mm. and that's what I just love about it. And, and when I finished um, at this school, the United World College. So that was the summer of 1988, showing my age. Um, they took me on for six weeks. So I house sat in my history teacher's house to look and looked after his dog um, in the middle of Las Vegas. And then I went to work every day um, as a, you know, as, as a, an intern and a reporter. And it was, yeah, it was great. It was great. There's a phone going here. <laughs> It's all right. Never, never no stops way. on a news desk. <laughs> um, so tell me then, so, so you finished out in America and it was, you came back to the UK and were you applying to go to Oxford from the US? Yeah, so, so it, was, it was quite odd because um, <clears throat> the, I can't remember what time of year the Oxford interviews would normally be, but um, I applied to get, I applied to Oxford um, and, and other English universities and I sat the Oxford entrance exams, but they were like geared for um, texts, A-level texts that I wasn't studying. Yeah. So I had to try and do that in tandem with the international baccalaureate. Anyway, I flunked the exams. So, and and I, I, had, I had an interview at Wadham College with um, Terry Eagleton, who's quite a sort of well-known literary critic. And, um, you know, it went okay, but I didn't get in. Um, and then when I came, when I, when I, when I, so I, I had some sort of backup universities potentially go, to go to, came home in 88, got my results from the International Baccalaureate, which were better than I thought they would be. Um, and on the back of that, I decided to reapply to Oxford. And so that meant I took a year out. So from 88 to 89, um, I worked in a pub as a barman which I'd been doing some summers anyway. Um, and I got a job, I applied for a job on the Glamorgan Gem, which is a weekly series of papers, which I think in the last two months has sadly closed. Yeah. Um, 
And that was set up and edited by a bloke called Barry Lloyd Jones, who was this sort of chain smoking old school, you know, his keyboard was covered in ash. Um, <laughs> fantastic guy. <clears throat> and he, he, he I, I, I applied to the, for, I had an interview for the gem and um, didn't get the job because I was really green. You know, I was still 18, 18. Yeah, I was still 18, almost 19. And um I showed him my work I'd done in, in, in New Mexico, but he offered the job to someone else. And then a couple of weeks later, he rang me up and he said, Jason, it's Barry Lloyd-Jones. That chap I offered the job to, I said, yeah, his wife's just left him. Can you come and do the job instead? So I said, yeah, sure. So I went in and I started off three days a week as a, just a totally untrained rookie reporter on the Glamorgan gem. And um, yeah, Barry taught me loads and loads um he then made me full time so I, I spent six months on the paper nice and then saved up enough money that summer I went into railing for sort of eight weeks through Europe which is fantastic um I got into Oxford somewhere <laughs> during during that year as well I mustn't forget that so yeah I reapplied to Oxford um on you know on the strength of my grades and um and that was that I read English yeah from 89 to to 92 um, and I, I didn't do any student journalism in Oxford, actually. Um, I, I went to one contributors meeting for the Charwell student newspaper and it was full of people I knew, just knew I wouldn't be able to get on with. <clears throat> so. Mm, I, I can imagine, Jason. <laughs> Is it true that... Uh, um, like Jacob B. Smog, probably. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? Um, at Oxford, is it right that um, all of your grades come from your exams? It's pure exam, or did you have to? Because I had weird? an option. I, I had an option to that we could do some papers in advance. So, God, I can't remember how many exams I had to sit at the end, but most of it was still down to finals. Yeah. So you've got to wear a sort of you know white bow tie, wing collar gown. Really, really practical stuff for seeing examinations in. But anyway, you... I came up with a credible 2-1, so in English language, so that was fine. What was your attraction for you of Oxford? Was it the, uh, you know, the obviously the credibility of the university? Was it, you know, like you say, there's probably a lot of people that were there that you maybe weren't aligned with? Yeah, I think... Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it's, it, I guess it is. The, it is the credibility. I mean, it's you know one of the best universities in the world. And if you think, you know, I might be able. There's a chance I might be able to get in. Um, my brother went to Oxford, and he was um, a few years ahead of me. Oh. And so he'd said a lot about it and the teaching experience and the sort of one-to-one -one tutorial teaching that they do, which was really intimidating. Um, and I was I was always a last-minute merchant, so I think you know, part of, this is probably the journalism in my blood, I suppose, I don't know, but deadlines, you know, I'm always sort of driven by deadlines and, but I always leave it quite late with deadlines as well. Um, still do actually. And um, I used to pull all nighters writing essays and then chain smoking Marlboros because I smoked back then and drinking far too much coffee. And then, you know, you've been up all night writing an essay about, I don't know, Spencer's The Fairy Queen or something. And then you'd have to go and read it to your tutor and, and try and be coherent and, 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 and make your academic arguments, you know, about the literature that you're sort of playing back to them. And um, yeah, so it was good. I had fun at Oxford and um there was a clear sort of class divide there, you know, there was, uh, although I'd come from a, what was basically a private school in America, um, you know, I was a product of the comprehensive school system in South Wales, um, which is where I'd lived then and um, was very proud of that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I came out of Oxford and went to the Cardiff School of Journalism. Yes. So obviously in your head, there was no doubt that you were going to stay in journalism. Um, but uh, was, did you have to do a qualification or you just wanted to? No, it didn't, it didn't have to. I mean, it, 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 there were various routes in. And um, in fact, while I was at Oxford, I applied to join the BBC. I got an interview with the BBC <clears throat> and 
I can't believe I did some of this stuff actually just thinking back but so they they to apply you had to um they wanted a kind of um a, 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 they wanted you to do something like a, an interview with someone or something like that so so it was Bruce Kent the CND guy was speaking at the Oxford Union and um I went up to BBC Radio Oxford and I blagged and I still can't believe this they lent me a like, really expensive tape recorder. And I said, oh, hello, you know, I'm Jason Clark, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm applying to the BBC. And as part of the application, I need to do this recording, blah, blah, blah. Can I borrow one of your really expensive, you know, tape recorders? And they said, yes, sure, which is great. So I got an interview um, in London on the 21st, my 21st birthday, actually. So that would have been 1991. But I fluffed it. I, I had to do um, I had to do a current affairs test, and they and and I had to do the thing about if you were um, you know putting together a news bulletin for radio, what order would you put these stories in? You know, and this is for BBC Radio Oxford, so you know you've got to apply news value and news sense and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then they gave me a scenario that um, the Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott. He said they said you're in a newsroom on a Sunday. You hear that John Prescott has been involved in a car accident or his entourage has been involved in a car accident in a, in a local village. Um, what would you do? And I said, oh, well, I, you know, first thing I do is call the emergency services and find out you know, what was going on. And they said that, no, you can't. That, well, you can do that. But, but basically, there's been, a, there's been a sort of media blackout put on this and emergency services won't tell you anything. And I said, well, I'd have to head out there. Oh, you can't do that because you've got to read the one o'clock news bulletin and you're on your own. And I was just racking my brains, what would I do? And the answer thereafter is I should, have, I should ring the pub in the village and just say, oh, did anyone see what happened? And um, which I'd done countless times as, you know, when I was on the Glamorgan Gen, ringing up local post offices or shops or did you see anything? And, you know, you'd be on a story. Really bloody obvious answer, ring the pub and did anyone see anything? And the interviewer was trying to, God bless him, he was trying to spoon feed this to me and was like going, it's Sunday lunchtime, you know, <laughs> the small village in the countryside, you know, and, and I just, I fluffed it. So, so my BBC days were over before they began. And I got back to my room in Oxford that night and my friend, God bless him, had left 21 bottles of Corona lager outside my door, all numbered. And, um, and I think we drank all of them that night <laughs> to commiserate how terribly I've done. But um, anyway, I, I went, I, I got accepted to the Cardiff School of Journalism. And what was interesting about that is that um, they didn't really mind in the slightest that I hadn't done any student journalism in the preceding three years um, at Oxford. Because I, like I said, I, I, I just didn't appeal to me. Um, but because I'd done, you know, some real journalism with um, a, a paper that was the, the gem, which was actually based in Cardiff um, during my year out, that that counted for a lot. And I, I was I was awarded a bursary because um, we didn't have heaps of cash and I, I couldn't actually afford to go. Um, so they they paid my fees, which was which was brilliant. And I did the. I did the print journalism course because you could also do broadcast or, or magazines and they expose you to sort of every bit of it. Um, yeah, so I did that um, in 1989. Is that right? No, sorry, 19, 1992. I'm getting all confused now because it was after Oxford. Anyway, and that's how I ended up in the West Country because as part of the Cardiff course, we had to do work experience. Um, and as ever, I'd left it rather late to organise mine, and there were only two papers left uh, that had <clears throat> placements on them. Now, one of them was the Coventry Evening Telegraph, and one of them was the Western Morning News. And the Coven I've, I'd been to Coventry on a bus to visit an ex-girlfriend, and um, I didn't like the look of it. And I'd, I'd never been—I'd never been to Devon. Also, the Telegraph, the Coventry Evening Telegraph. I think they wanted 110 minutes. Uh, that's 110 words a minute shorthand, which I didn't have. And the Western Morning News didn't, they only wanted 100 words a minute, I think. Anyway, I came down to the Western Morning News and I did a two week work placement in the Easter of, when was it, 93, something like that. And at the end of the two weeks, I was called in and offered a job. So I knew before I'd even finished my 
course at Cardiff that I would be able to start work on the Western Morning News that summer, so August that year. Tell me about um, the Western Morning News in those days. So um, it was a it was a prestigious and well read paper, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it still is a, a, a prestigious paper in many respects. Although you know things have changed so much since then. Um, but yeah, I mean, I joined it. I, so I was a I was a trainee reporter. I was up in the Barnstable office in North Devon. And there were, you know, there were three of us um, up there. Well, there were two when I was there. It became three later on. Um, and, you know, they had they had what we call district offices all over the place. So they would have reporters, not just in Plymouth, but Barnstable, Exeter, Newton Abbott, Penzance, Bude, Truro, you know. And, and these offices would have two, sometimes three people in them. But we were also doing lots of different editions, so, you know, you would do, I don't know, seven or eight geographical editions of the paper um, that all had their local news in them. Um, yeah, so I, I started off as a trainee um, and uh, under a dear old guy called Mark Clough, who's sadly no longer with us. And, and he taught me a huge amount. And I was only in Barnstable for 10 months and then was transferred to Plymouth, where I worked as a just a general reporter covered my first murder story which was out in Sulcombe in where Sulcombe? I was, yeah I would hotel. not have put money on that being the first murder that you covered yeah a hotel worker very sad um and you know was given the office mobile because you know they had, we this had one, big? one mobile phone yeah size of a brick wasn't quite that bad but I mean it's it, it's really interesting because, you know, that was, you know, so we're talking, what, 93, 94? So, all right, it's 25 years ago. But, you know, Google wasn't invented then. Mm. You know, that came in 98. Um, the internet was not a thing, really. Um, and, I mean, I was a really early adopter of the internet because I went and did a story about a, 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 an Exeter business um, that was – an internet provider and it was one of the really early ones and I signed up with them and I had this thing in my house or my flat you know the internet I didn't know what to bloody do with it though um anyway yeah so and then a few years later I was I became the business editor of the Western Morning News probably around I don't know 94 95 so I was 24 years old um and that was quite daunting, but, but, you know, they put a lot of trust in me and that was a job I loved actually. Um, and it was, it was a great time, really good fun. And then in 1996, so I'd been on the paper, what, three years then, um, I was made the news editor. So that's the guy that's kind of running the news desk, um, divvying out work to reporters, judging the strength of stories, um, producing a, a daily news list that you're then produce, you know, um, presenting to your editor. And I used to be called Black Flag Clark um, because sometimes I'd, I'd just come up with really depressing news lists, you know, that'd be full of death and carnage. And my then editor, Barry Williams, would say, bloody hell, Clark, and you've got some good news we can put in this paper tomorrow. Um, so I did that for four years, uh, which was um, quite an intense period really um because i i started in i think it was around december 96 as the as the news editor and i was 20 what 26 then and the paper the morning news had always been a broadsheet and had held out you know for years and years it was you know hadn't gone tabloid and then and then the editor decided the decision was taken to to to, to take it tabloid although we didn't call it a tabloid of course we called it the compact morning news <laughs> but that that meant huge changes in how we produced the paper right and um you know because stories would be shorter um the design was completely overhauled uh stories had to be written in a way that they would fit the design lots more sort of nibs you know news in brief sorts of things um and a whole new editorial system to deliver it an it system as well so it was really quite an intense period. And I was, I was quite a young guy, really, trying to manage 
put, or you know, not me managing it, but I was part of the machinery of of doing that. Um, but those were those were great times, and and the the most probably the most memorable story was the death of Princess Diana. Right. And I got a phone call at uh, on it was on a Sunday morning. I remember. <clears throat> at about I got a call about I don't know five o'clock in the morning, and it was the the, the deputy editor um, ringing up and saying Barry wants to do a Sunday edition. Barry, the editor, wants to do a Sunday edition. First time in the paper's history. So we we piled in, got together as many people as we could, um, and we just took Saturday's paper and started stripping out pages from the front and the back and worked our way inwards. And we were just filling it with photographs. The Press Association had this massive rolling obituary going as they were trying to get reaction from around the world. And I think we had that, we got, and bear in mind, you know, the morning news was, was a morning paper. So it was, it was entirely geared to overnight production. So you'd put it to bed about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night, the night before, and it would be on the streets in the morning. We were in the newsroom by half past five, six o'clock. We had a paper on the streets, I think by lunchtime, which was a, you know, a huge effort. Um, and one of, the, one of the biggest jobs apparently was trying to find, um, I don't know if this is true, but it's a story I was told later, one of the biggest jobs was trying to find um, a press crew to operate the press that was sober enough because they'd all been out you know, <laughs> on the razzle uh, on, the, on a Saturday night, as you would. Yeah. And then trying to get these guys in operating heavy machinery. Um, anyway, we sat there and, and, and local telly came round and, you know, were filming it coming off the presses. And the headline was Diana killed. That, that's all it needed to say. Um, and then we sat there sort of taking a deep breath at lunchtime and I thought, bugger, we've got to do it all again because we yeah. had to do it for Monday. And that was one of the longest days I've ever worked. But the adrenaline just takes over and it was, um, it was just incredible. Very sad time. But um, yeah, that's probably one of the most memorable things. So tell me about the news desk. How do people used to get stuff past you? <laughs> it's quite funny so we we had um there was one reporter in particular who i won't name but he was notorious for trying to recycle stories that you'd you'd turn down so because the way it would work is you do it you do your ring rounds in the morning and you'd sp speak to all your various district offices and they'd be filing their own sort of news lists to you and saying this is what we've got coming up you know we've got such and such court story happening or we've got an inquest <laughs> Do you want to get that? <laughs> no, right. Are you wanted for an emergency? No, it's fine. Um, what I will do is just switch this off. There we go. So um, the way the news has to run, yeah, you know, should I keep going on that one? Yeah. Yeah. But the only thing I'd say is, can you stop banging your hand? Oh, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, I'm banging my hand. Not right. loads. But um, yeah, so do you want to, you knew where you were. So the way the news desk worked. So you the reporter that was uh, recycling stories. So yeah. So, so, so basically you would get the measure of what that day's news agenda was. Um, you know, as a news editor, you're, you're listening out you'd have the papers delivered to your house in the morning. So you'd be going through the nationals and see what's making the nationals. Um, you'd be listening to local radio, watching telly. Um, you'd have stuff in the diary that you knew was coming up. So that might be an inquest or it might be a court case or, you know, a juicy industrial tribunal or, you know, something like that. Um, there'd be all sorts of other events in the diary picture stories that you knew were happening and so you know you'd work with your picture desk as well yeah so it was all about marshalling the content into um and, and trying to order it in such a way that it wasn't you know the black flag edition that I specialized in but would give readers a real mix of stuff and we took quite a clinical approach and this was introduced by the editor to to the content um which in, in it's funny when you think about it it's almost like a sort of forerunner of of, of content marketing these days in a way, because we, when the morning news went tabloid, there was a lot of market research done about what its audience was. 
And there were different types of Western Morning News reader. So there might be farmers, business people, um, the grey market. Um, we knew that people were happy to travel in the West Country to buy stuff. So in other words, you know, you wouldn't think twice about maybe driving 45 minutes to your favourite farm shop or down to Trago Mills, you know, in the Glen Valley. Or, and, and all of this kind of data came in. And, and I was tasked with constructing a news list every day that would hit those silos of readers so that at the end of the day we knew we had a paper which was going to appeal to all those audience groups mm -hmm. and it was really quite an interesting way of doing it um, and quite unusual I think um, at the time because it was you know it was quite a clinical way of dealing with you know making sure the content was matching matching the audience that was going to consume it. Like you say, that's really how I guess it's led in. Like, there's the same principle with a lot of content marketing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, did you have PRs calling you on the news desk then? Oh, all the time. All the time. I used to hate PR people. <clears throat> uh, it, it's very, I, that's why I find it so interesting that you, it's not uncommon, is it, for journalists to move towards PR, but equally, I've never known a journalist not bitch about PRs, and I've <laughs> never known PRs not, you know, maybe roll their eyes at journey is, there's you know when, when you're on a news desk there's different types of prs so there's there's a pr that will ring you up <clears throat> who's done no research about what sort of title you are who your readers are or what sort of content you know and they're, and they're trying to sell you a story about pop tarts or something like that you know and it's like no i haven't got time and i would just be that blunt because you know, it's a pressure cooker environment and the phone's going all the time and you're trying to keep tabs on a myriad of different stories that so are all moving and changing throughout the day and that dictates where they're going to go in the paper. And then somebody rings up and says, you know, oh, can I, you know, can I talk to you about this? And it's like, no, don't. And then you've got other PRs who are, you know, know what, know what you want know what you need, know what's going to work. Um, and, and those were the ones that you'd have the time for, but they were, they were few and far between. Um, and quite often they might be, for example, like, like university PRs, you know, they will say, oh, we've got a really good um, research story that's, say, come out of Exeter University or Plymouth University or something like that um, that's going to be relevant to your readers or, you know. So... so yeah, I used to give them short shrift quite a lot, really. And then oh. I crossed the dark side, of course. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about that, then. Uh, did you um, always know that you were going to do that? Or was it just called sort of an opportunity that came across the path? It was an opportunity. So I did four years on the news desk um, and then was asked to look again at the paper's business coverage um, and to really sort of reinvigorate that. So I came off the news desk in the last sort of year I was on the paper and looked at really getting the business coverage um, singing along nicely. Um, we launched a monthly business magazine as well, a glossy A4 magazine, which I edited, wrote a lot of. Um, it was short lived, unfortunately, because commercially, there just mm. wasn't the sort of market for it. I mean, with hindsight, I don't think it was pro probably properly marketed either. Um, but it was called, what was it called? West Country Business, I think. I've still got the copies at home. But um, yeah, so in my final sort of yeah, year, 10 months, I was um, working on the, on the business side of things. And I was thinking, okay, well, where's my career going to go here, go, go now? Um, do I want to leave this area and, you know, pursue a deputy editorship or something like that, you know, elsewhere in the group, if there are any opportunities. So I was sort of having those, those thoughts to myself. Um, and then I got a phone call from somebody called Deborah Clark, no, no, uh, no relation to me. And um, she said, do you know of any journalists who might be interested in a job in PR? <laughs> and I said, are you offering me a job? And she said, oh, I might be. Anyway, I, I weighed it up and um, there were all sorts of personal things going on as well. Uh, like I just bought a house with my wife. 
she just got her first job at Darrowford Hospital. Um, and we sort of thought, well, do we want to leave the region? It was a good opportunity at Deborah Clark and Associates, as it was then called. Um, so I took the plunge, which not without a great deal of trepidation, because, mm. <clears throat> do you know what, my biggest fear was that I'd be bored. I thought, I was worried that there wouldn't be enough variety in, in PR um, compared to the dynamism of a newsroom, you know, mm. that, I'd been, that I'd been used to. Um, and I'm pleased to report that I was um, gravely mistaken because it was just as exciting. And what was quite funny is I ended up going to work for clients on whom I'd done hatchet jobs when I was on the, on the newspaper. So apparently it wasn't without some trepidation. Some of these clients were saying, oh, what, Jason Clark is going to be our account manager. <laughs> but he used to write horrible things about us in the Western Morning News. Oh, no. So that was quite an interesting uh, dynamic. <laughs> but it's, no, it, all, it all settled down. And the hardest thing was you'd, you'd sit down with clients and they, you know, you, you, you'd be talking about, OK, so, you know, what are your objectives, what do you want to achieve, um, why do we want to do this, who do we want to talk to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'd come away with a notebook full of fantastic stories, which if I'd been still on the other side of the fence, I'd be thinking, wow, I could fill the paper with that tomorrow. <laughs> And then you'd have to sit on it all until the time was right to uh, to get it out there. Ah, oh, it's a fun it's a fun transition. But uh, so, tell me about PR, and you talk about it as channeling information. Yeah, I mean it's um, it's changed a lot. So when you know. Deborah Clark Associates, or DCA as we're now known, um, I think one of the big strengths of DCA has always been uh, media relations, you know, um, and, and we've got a number of ex-journos on the team. Um, and, you know, back in the days when I started, so that would be 2001, so 20 years next year, blimey. Um, you know, a lot of what we did was around, you know, media relations, and it's about it's about press releases and it's about getting clients into the papers and on telly and radio and that sort of stuff. And, and we've moved a world away from that now um, in terms of, you know, what we do as an agency and, and, you know, media relations are still an important part of it. And, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate that I think the people we've got are respected in our field and are respected by, by journalists for what we do and how we do it. But, you know, the media relations bit of a client brief is now is much further down the pecking order than it ever used to be in terms of, in, in, in terms of public relations. And it's much more about often using the client's own channels um, to get to their audiences. So, you know, whether that's sort of social media or it's on their, their own websites or it's digital marketing, and the whole nature of a notion of, you know, press releases and getting your story in the local rag um, just really is, is completely changed um, in terms of where the emphasis is. But fundamentally, and I said earlier, I'm a storyteller, you know, that's, I think that's still, still what I do. And it's about, it's about taking information and it's about, repackaging that information in ways that people can access and understand and in understanding that information they they take something away from it um that you want them to take away mm. preferably <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah to my mind it's um th th you know there are very simple principles that um that underline it all and that's what i've done throughout my throughout my career is, is, is martial information in ways that, that people can understand and relate to. And I, I, I enjoy that. It's, um, it's a lot harder than it sounds as well, isn't it? Like, you know, the idea of taking a load of complex information and turning that into something that's easily communicated and easily digested. You know, it sounds like, yeah. eh, but 
you know, there's a yeah, huge and, and, and skill. <clears throat> yeah, and it's and it's you because often you're taking the same information, you're presenting it um, in in um, different ways for different audiences. So a client might come to me and say, "Okay, Jace, well, we've got our our annual results coming up, so." We, want, we do want a press release because we want to tell the market that we're doing well and we've made a profit this year and we want people to be um, confident in dealing with us. So publicly, we want, need people to know that we're doing well. But we're also going to need communication for our shareholders. So, you know, they need to know that um, uh, they're going to get a dividend this year or that we're going to do a rights issue or whatever it might be. <coughs> And we want to communicate with our staff, we want to give them a pat on the back as well and tell them what we've, what we've done, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you're taking the same fundamental information in that respect, but you are, you're dealing with it or packaging it in different ways with different emphasis, depending on who the audience is. Mm. And that's what we do. And it's, you know, whether we're doing that through Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or client websites, or press releases, or blogs, or video increasingly. Um, it's fundamentally all about information. Do you think you can get people, how much do you think with this kind of uh, communications, how much of it is, is learned and how much do you think of it? You know, can you teach someone to be way better with how they do that? How, how can people be better at thinking about um, what they're communicating and to who? I, I think it's, it's all about, um, I always talk about keeping it real. So there's an awful lot of hyperbole in PR mm. and it doesn't serve anyone's interests because people will see it as guff if it is guff. Um, it doesn't help the client. It doesn't help the PR. Um, and, it, and it gives your audiences the wrong impression and I, I see I see quite a lot of PR that is um is very lightweight mm, not really saying anything but they're trying to say not, it anyway yeah or it's tone deaf mm. um where people are you know it's noise stuff is just being put out there for the sake of it and I think I think you can teach it um and and it's something I think that we try and instill in our team about having an awareness of what's going on around you. Because if you're making really important judgments with your client's information about how you're going to present that to whom and in what fashion, then you need to know what else is going on around you. Otherwise you're doing it in an echo chamber um, or a bubble um, and it could really backfire. And I think, you know, I'm 50 now, so I've been around long enough to have that spidey sense, we call it, or those antennae or, you know, and, and, and you, your antennae do tingle when you know, well, when, when you're aware of what's happening around you. It's, it's, it's just absolutely vital. And I, I don't know to what extent that's a taught thing. I mean, I've never done a PR sort of, course i did a journalism course but um but one thing that journalism taught me is and that's why i used to read the papers every day and listen to the radio and watch the news so that when you're actually sitting in the hot seat making editorial judgments about content in a newspaper you know you've got the zeitgeist you know what's going on you know what people are talking about and that's that's really crucial to know what is out there Otherwise, you know, your stuff is irrelevant, potentially. I think in general, in marketing and comms, you're only as good as your broader, broader awareness. Like if you're, not, if you're not aware of what's going on in the world, if you're not aware of what, you know, what good looks like and how it's delivered, how can you possibly cut through that? How can you find an angle? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's what, that's what people hire us for if I'm honest because I, I think you know we've got we have got um we've got a good mixture we've got quite a mature team and we've got you know the the bright young things that we've brought in to do the stuff that I don't know how to do you know um I pay people to do social media you know I love social media myself you know I've been on 
Facebook, Twitter for years. And, but it's, it's a play thing for me. Um, and, but increasingly, you know, we've got, we've got stacks of clients where we're managing, <clears throat> managing social feeds and that sort of thing. And you need to have that awareness about you. Um, and the younger members of the team who might not have that experience, they can always defer to us as the oldies. It's really not like that in the business, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do you know what I mean? There's, the, there's the, the combination of the experience and the sort of cutting edge skills that we need to be communicators in this day and age. Um, and, and, you know, that, that is what people pay for. They, they want to know that you're, because you're being paid to manage someone's reputation ultimately mm. um, and to project them in ways that they want to be projected or to protect them from reputational damage. And, and you need a maturity, I think, to be able to do that. And you, need, you do need that fundamental awareness of the wider world and what's going on. With your younger staff then, do you encourage them to uh, read the news, listen to the news, read magazines, or do you just... I, they, they, they tend to anyway, because um, like I said, a lot of them have got, have got either backgrounds in journalism or have maybe done a degree with an element of journalism in it. Um, so they, they're, I, I think they're naturally inquisitive people anyway. Um, so it's not something that we kind of enforce but I think they're, they're all aware that to do their jobs, they, they, they need to stay up to, up to speed with what's going on in the world. Mm, for sure. Um, you talk about reputation. Mm. I'd like to talk about crises. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's something, well, I mean, everybody loves a crisis when it's not happening to them. Um, and, you know, I, I know you guys work a lot like more broadly, but also um, I think you're the first person a lot of people think of when it comes to crisis PR. Um, when the proverbial hits the fan. Mm. Um, tell me about it from your perspective. So um, did you accidentally become quite good at managing those kinds of situations or, um, you know, it, does it come from the journalism side? I think it probably it probably comes from the journalism side because, you know, the, every crisis has its own sort of anatomy in terms of what's happened, why, and who's to blame fundamentally. Um, and, you know, that is the default position <clears throat> the media will take with with anything that is a crisis. And, you know, crucially, they the first thing you've got to do is marshal the facts. Again, it's about the information, what has actually happened. Um, Everything about blame usually comes a bit later, but it, it, it comes around increasingly faster because of the nature of our media now. Um, so I think, yeah, the, it's, it's the, the journalism background. It's also, I think, because what journalism teaches you is, um, is to turn stuff around very quickly as well. So it's about being able to respond. Well, it's about, it's about a number of things. It is about being able to respond to a crisis very quickly, but it's also about, being able to anticipate a crisis or anticipate issues which may impact on the client's reputation. Um, so, you know, as an example, we quite often take part in exercises. We have some aviation clients um, and, you know, we will desktop exercise um, emergency responses and quite often that might be because that's a CAA requirement um, for them to test their own emergency procedures with the Civil Aviation Authority and local emergency services. And then DCA is part of that. So we will be sitting down with the client. And in that sort of scenario, you know, you're basically saying, OK, let's let's deal with a scenario where there's where a plane has crashed. Um, how would we deal with it? Um, and that is really, you've got the immediacy of the situation. And in a way, you've got to park that because from our point of view, in, that, in a real case scenario like that, our job is about business continuity. You've got the horror of what's happened, but it's actually the emergency services and their comms channels which deal with the immediacy of that. 
our job would be, okay, so what is that going to do to consumer confidence in your brand? Are people going to stop flying with you because there's been an accident? Um, how is your website going to cope? Is your call center tooled up to deal with friends and relatives ringing in? You know, what are you going to tell them if there's been an accident? Um, so it's about, it's about sort of modeling all of that. I mean, that's a very specific example. Um, and, and I've got a real life example, if you want, I'll give you an, a, a, an anecdote. So, so the client Air Southwest is a long time ago now, but Air Southwest, so that was an airline that um, used to operate out of Plymouth and Newquay, regional airline. We launched them back in 2003, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> and in 2006, I was sitting um, in our office, um, got a call from the airline. They said, Jace, um, our Gatwick flight just took off from Newquay and a wheel's fallen off the plane. And I'm like, right, okay, where did the wheel land? Oh, it's okay, it bounced down the runway. I said, what's happening now? And they said, well, basically, they're going to circle the airfield. Um, they're going to burn off fuel. Then they're going to try and land. And I'm like, right, okay. So we had to put the whole – so everyone in the office, I just sort of got everyone to down tools – we got our emergency clipboards out, which um, for logging media calls, all that kind of stuff. Um, and luckily, uh, there was a brilliant pilot on board. And they did a few flybys of the tower at Newquay because it was the tower that had told them their wheel had fallen off. And the pilot said, right, I'm going to fly by. And can you have a look at the undercarriage and see what we've got left? Because they had no idea whether they had any other wheels or, you know. Anyway, luckily, there's lots of redundancy built on these planes, so they could actually land it with one wheel missing because it was one of a pair that had gone under one, under one of the wings. But what was amazing about that, and this is, so this is 2006, okay? So, you know, Facebook is, what, two years old? Twitter had been going nine months. Um, Instagram didn't even exist. You know, so social media is really in its infancy. The plane landed... It was the longest 35 minutes of my life. The plane <laughs> landed safely. The pilot brought it in on one side. And at the very last minute, he just dropped the right-hand wing, I think it was. And, you know, everyone applauded. Um, and we knew from that moment that everyone was safe. We knew very quickly after that that everyone had got off the aircraft and had immediately got onto another aircraft, a spare aircraft, and they were on their way to Gatwick. So in terms of business continuity and getting the message out there that passengers still had confidence in the airline, it was a really important message to say that everyone had got off that plane and just got onto another one and flown yeah. off, you know. But also it was really important that we had the right information because seconds after the plane landed, um, I had a call from the news editor of ITV West Country saying, Jace, we've just had a call from a bus driver at Newquay saying that one of your planes has crashed. And it hadn't crashed, but it had been met by, it, there was a full blue light response because they didn't know whether or not it was going to go cartwheeling down the runway and everyone and end in a fireball, you know. So we had to deal with that. Radio Cornwall had rung me while it was in the air saying, Oh, we've had we've had someone ring in saying they can smell aviation fuel, and one of your planes is surfing the airport, making funny noises, and that's because they were. I think they were trying to burn off fuel. They weren't dumping fuel. That was a question that we were asked later, but they weren't dumping fuel. But they had to burn off fuel anyway. So we marshaled all this information. Then we put the managing director of the airline up for interview on on Radio Cornwall that night, and he explained basically a wheel fell off. There is lots of redundancy built into these aircraft. It landed safely. Pilot did a brilliant job. Nobody was hurt. And all the passengers completed their journey, you know, job done. And then the next year, there was an air accident investigation branch report. And what had happened, what happened was when the plane had its deep maintenance, um, which was carried out by a third party, I think, they put the, lo the wrong lubricant into that bearing, wheel bearing, um, and that meant that after, you know, successive landings and takeoffs, it, it just sheared off. So it wasn't the airline's fault. Um, it was a maintenance issue uh, by a third party. But anyway, that's... But the really funny thing about aviation is that the media get really excited 
about anything to do with planes. And it's the nature of the aviation industry to downplay everything as much as possible. So in the world of social media now, you get these hilarious situations where, well, they're probably not hilarious if you're involved in a smoke coming into the cockpit or something, where you've got airlines putting out these really dull statements saying, you know, X, Y, Z. And then you've got passengers posting in real time, screaming passengers, you know, with smoke filling in the cockpit. And it's, it just shows you how things have changed. Um, one, more, one more quick anecdote about, about Air Southwest. My colleague, John, got a phone call at 4 a.m. one morning. Um, again, this is some years ago now. Um, and it was all about an Air Southwest flight, and they were carrying the Stoke City Football Club. Because what Air Southwest used to do is they used to charter their planes out to football clubs across the UK and, like, fly them to different matches. It was a sort of sideline, you know, money, uh, money spinner. And they picked up Stoke City, and they were going to take them up to East Midlands Airport from Southampton, I think. But they, there was a smell of smoke or burning in the, in, in the cabin. So the pilot elected to put into, um, put into Heathrow anyway. So they, they, again, it was a blue light response. So the Sun newspaper um, rings up and um, my friend John, it's a 4 a.m. or whatever, and, and he's having to deal with these various media calls. Anyway, by the time it was printed in the sun, it had become a desperate mid-air scare. And it was nothing of the sort. It really, it really wasn't. And, and what had actually happened is there'd been a tiny oil leak. One drop of oil had vaporized on the manifold of the engine, had been ingested by the aircraft's air conditioning system. So it made a real stink, but it, there wasn't any danger. But um, yeah, desperate mid-air scare. And so... It's really difficult to keep a lid on something like that. And, and, and the media can get very overexcited about stuff. Um, but it, the, the point about that first story about the wheel, it's, it's about having the right information. And the client did absolutely the right thing because they rang us as soon as they knew there was an issue. Mm. And that's really important. And it's really important that clients are absolutely straight up with you in terms of what's going on and what they know has happened. And you, you know, you then take a decision. Well, what, you know, how much of that information is it timely to release now? What do we know with any certainty? What don't we know? You know, we dealt with a, a fatality in a, in a Nuki hotel, again, a few years back, where, where the client was the hotel owner and a guest sadly had been found dead. Um, and the fire brigade had measured really high levels of carbon monoxide in the building um, and some of the paramedics had to be treated later in the day as well. And, and, and our client was the innocent party in all of this. It transpired that the, the hotel in question had just had a sort of million pound refurb and a window which had been nailed shut years previously had been replaced. And unbeknown to anyone, that window was near the vent for the boiler um, and when the boiler was replaced years earlier, the window had been nailed shut by the boiler contractor, who was later prosecuted um, and um, found guilty. Um, but we had to deal with that on the day. It was a Sunday morning. Um, and it took two of us, you know, all day to, to, to manage that situation. Mm. And our advice to the client was, look, you know, we don't know what's happened yet. Um, and it, it was a family-owned business that's well regarded. Um, and there was sympathy, I think, in the media because they could see that this had just seemed to have been a terrible accident. Yeah. Um, and we, we, our advice to the client was, well, you should put someone up to talk about this. Just say what you know. Um, obviously express regret at what has happened because it's a terrible thing, that you're cooperating fully with the investigation. Mm. Um, and, and by just being upfront and honest about it, um, the media actually do, do appreciate that. Mm. And, uh, and another thing is you, we advise our clients, you know, don't treat the media as, as just sort of fair weather friends either. Because, you know, when things do go bad, if you've got a good relationship with them, it can be easier to manage situations. Um, yeah, so the, so the crisis comms piece is, um, 
yeah, it's some, something that we've just just sort of evolved and and it takes many forms and yeah you know there's hr issues that we've dealt with um i've had a covid case in a hotel i've dealt with in the last few weeks just advising the client on how to communicate that internally how to communicate it externally working with track and trace you know all that kind of stuff and it's you're just trying to anticipate um where the reputational impact might be um, and making sure that you're working with those different groups of people in audiences, whether that's internal or external, and what you're telling them. The, the, like you say, the interesting thing with the crisis stuff now is that it's so quick, isn't it? You know, social media just means that it's instantaneous, uh, which means yeah. that the phone ringing is instantaneous, um, you know, and you've got your mobiles and your landlines and before you know it like it's just like an explosion um we've got we're dealing with an issue right now as i'm talking my colleague john has got an issue where um where somebody on twitter quite prominent person in in the region anyway um has basically fingered one of our clients as being the source of a pollution incident um and it's not them and they this person has made an assumption and uh, the local media are on to it via Twitter because they've seen our client named by this prominent individual saying, oh, yes, I'll be having words with so-and-so, name of company, that shall be nameless. Um, so at the moment, we're dealing with, we're going to be contacting that individual to actually correct it on Twitter. Yeah. Um, mm, slanderous. But it does, it, yeah, stuff travels incredibly quickly. And that's, that's why you know, a lot of what we do is trying to anticipate um, issues and how you're going to respond. I think the other thing, though, as part of that is how quickly they die down, though, right? Yeah, I mean, there is, you know, there used to be an expression in newspapers, well, it's all going to be chip paper tomorrow. I don't know what the digital equivalent is now. We'll have to come up with a, yeah, something right. to, to describe it. But, um, yeah, thing, thing, things do come and go, but the, the problem with the internet and social media is that, you know, it's, it's kind of there forever. Mm. Um, and you could argue that with, with papers, it wasn't because it was chip paper. Yeah. You know, unless you've got a microfiche library and like the Western Morning News used to have up at Dereford, you know, you're not going to go back and find that stuff. But now it's, now it's there forever, which is important to, you know, that you're getting your messages across in that media. So, it can be part of the historical record. That's the problem though, isn't it? Is that then, you know, ugh, like it's cause it is all kept a swift Google and it all comes back up again. <laughs> oh dear. Um, I guess a question I have for you is, is there anybody or any company or any campaign that you would love to work on is there anybody that you'd love to reputationally manage you can absolutely reputationally manage me if you'd like to <laughs> <laughs> i don't promise That's to behave impossible. i know what you get up to um <laughs> oh that's a really difficult question i one thing i would really i would like to have done is perhaps do political um campaign stuff i mean some of our work is is very sort of public affairs based, and you know we do we do quite a lot also around um, around the planning system, for example, in terms of working with clients. Um, you know, planning can be quite contentious. It can you know quickly be hijacked by interest groups who might not want something to happen. Um, and then our role is okay. Well, how do you engage with those groups in a meaningful way? Um, how do you talk to them about what's being proposed um, and hopefully how do you, you know, persuade them that what you're proposing is a good thing. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. You don't want to go into poli uh, politics. Sorry, sorry, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think one of, my, one of my regrets, this is a bit anecdotal again, but when I was at university, um, my college launched these uh, a scholarship program where during your holidays you could go to North America and visit all, all the old alumni of my Oxford College 
And it was a really canny way for the college to keep in touch with its alumni because, you know, you'd send an undergraduate in and they'd be, you'd be updating all these people about who you'd stay with, you know, on your travels about what was happening with your old college and blah, blah, blah. Um, and we were sent a whole list of people that we could. And anyway, I applied and I got accepted on this scholarship thing. So basically it was like $5,000 to go to America, travel around visiting University College Oxford alumni um i mean god what's not not to like and so they gave us a whole stack of people that we could go and stay with um, <laughs> and one of them was one of them was william jefferson clinton um who was then governor of arkansas and um a friend of mine from the states uh, had lived in arkansas and had always told me it was a real pit so i just sort of went no i don't want to go and stay with him and of course oh, bill clinton no. that year then decided that he was gonna run for run for president and I have always wondered if if I had gone to stay with Bill and Hillary you might have been his right hand man henceforth exactly I could have been working on his campaign which I would have (laughs) happily volunteered to do yeah um, if if that's something that I've been able to do at that time in my life you could have driven Um, the bus you are you could have driven the actual bus yeah maybe maybe Uh, I can't drive a bus (laughs) So, yeah, that's that's something which often crosses my mind. You know, my life could have taken a completely different path. And I I would love to. Yeah, political campaigning, I think, is something that I'd really like to try my hand at. I'm not sure I ever will. Uh, and, it, and it's partly driven by what what we're seeing in the States at the moment. And. Mm the role that social media is playing in 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 really corrupting the democratic process. Um, But that's why I wonder whether or not actually it would destroy you because you're somebody with integrity and uh, political campaigning, even if you look at obviously what's happened in this country with Brexit, uh, it's not, like you say, it's undermined the democratic process, but it's also... Um, it doesn't come from a place of integrity anymore. It, truth doesn't matter. No, that's true. And maybe in that respect, I'm just being an, an, an idealist because you're absolutely right. I mean, what, you know, what the whole Brexit debate has done and, and subsequently the whole Trump era, actually, is it, it has really cheapened discourse, public discourse, and it's, and it's polarised it as well mm. um, in, in a really damaging way, I think. And, you know, I've still got lots of friends in America and and they were deeply worried that a second Trump term would actually cause irreparable damage to, you know, what the founding fathers tried to build in the States. Um, And I think they're right. Uh, I think Trump is on his way out. I I can't see any way um, of him coming back because none of his lawsuits is uh, is succeeding at the moment he's gonna need a better lawyer if he wants to uh, <laughs> well yeah yeah who's um yeah with better hair dye i well. know i mean what the hell yeah i mean and that's still you know that's cultural reference for anyone who's not unaware rudy giuliani gives a press conference as trump's personal lawyer yesterday and halfway through it brown streaks start trickling down his temples because he's used some kind of temporary hair dye um that was on the Today program this morning, you know. Oh, they, it was everywhere. Uh, yeah, so I've not really answered your question, Katie. But in terms of who would who would I like to PR or or, or act for? Um, but like, yeah, pol- politics does absolutely fascinate me, and and I do yearn for a day when when we have more intelligent debate, um, and 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 maybe when some of these polarizing issues and people. Um, are no longer on the scene it will it will change things for the better but i'm not i'm not convinced and the problem is the the, the nature of the digital media now and social media in particular is 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 i think perpetually will fuel that um well i think deep. it's just made it really hard like if you want to create a campaign that is based around truth integrity genuine debate you can't fight because of the way social media works and because of the way algorithms works, because of the way the, the, you know, the media has been twisted, you know, throwing in the idea of fake news, then how do you discern what is and what isn't? Uh, you, you have to fight fire with fire, else you're just going to keep losing. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily, you, you know, because in, in, the, in the case of the Trump campaign, they're lying 
you know, that it's it's just all lies. And, and, and you're absolutely right. That is what they try and do. And the alt-right, it's all about sowing the seeds of um, confusion. So mm. people don't know what is right and what is wrong anymore. Um, but I will forever be a champion of, um, of, of, of fact. Mm. <laughs> and, and what is fact? Um, and I read a quote the other day, you know, every man's entitled to his opinion, but he's not entitled to his own facts. No. Um, and, and that's what Trump has tried to, uh, you know, Kellyanne Conway is one of his advisors, described alternate facts, didn't she, mm. famous? Um, and that's what they've been dealing in. Um, so I hope that, you know, history won't be kind to Trump. And when he is consigned to the dustbin, um, then I hope that we'll see some kind of recovery in the, in the quality of our discourse. But the problem is he's still on the scene and um, I suspect he'll still be energising the Republican Party and may even run next time. Well, they just so, need to get him in prison as quickly as possible, basically, don't they? <laughs> like, they just need to, you know, all of those court cases that have been halted, they just need to just press ahead and hope that he keeps his current lawyer. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um <laughs> i think uh what you say is really interesting like you say what you know speaking about starting from the point of facts and as somebody who's worked with you i know that the first thing you always say is what do we know let's start with what yeah. we know absolutely that's that's the only starting point and and what's interesting i think you know we advise again because of the nature of the world we live in and 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 the ephemeral nature of, of, of things. It's important that you get your facts down. You can not only get them straight, but put them somewhere that people can access. So, you know, we would say to clients, okay, well, look, if you want to try and win this argument, then you need to be articulating it clearly and in a place that people can go to, to make up their own minds. And so it's important that you're getting that information put somewhere and I mean by that, I mean probably on a website or something like that, mm. so that you've got you've got that reference point, um, because it's also important for clients that if they're dealing with a contentious issue, that you've not only got the facts out there, but that you're not seeing their teams having to constantly refute whether it's you know a campaign group or just people out there lying about them. Um, that can be a real war of attrition, particularly for small teams. And I think where, where PR can add value to that is by marshalling that information and putting it in the right places that people can go to to make up their own minds and taking pressure off, you know, frontline teams who need to concentrate on delivering other things. Yeah. It can be wearing otherwise, can't it? Absolutely. It can be hugely wearing. And, and quite distressing as well if um, if people are, are are suffering abuse. Yeah, it does happen. Um, yeah. How did we get to this? <laughs> well, it's uh, what did they call you? It was the black mark. <laughs> yeah, black flag Clark. That's right. Yeah. Well, thanks for depressing everyone on the podcast. <laughs> um. <laughs> but I, I love what I do, and. Um, like I said, my biggest fear coming into PR was it wasn't, wouldn't be varied enough compared to, you know, the journalism and running a busy newsroom. And uh, I'm pleased to say that I love what I do. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for, Mr. Clark. No, indeed. <laughs> um, I am so grateful to you for coming onto the Marketing Forum podcast and having a chat. I think you've got some really interesting stories and anecdotes and... Um, you know, you've got so much experience. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure, Katie. You're very welcome. So I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jason Clark. And you can, of course, like and subscribe, whether you're watching on YouTube, uh, where you can watch, of course, these conversations, or if you're listening to the podcast on any of your usual podcast platforms, please do like, subscribe, and of course, follow the Marketing Forum on social media. We have got more podcasts coming your way soon, so keep yourself in the loop and stay in touch.